A decade since Kevin Rudd's apology to the stolen generation and Indigenous children are ten times more likely to be placed in out-of-home care than non-Indigenous children. A new documentary aimed at highlighting these statistics is about to be screened. The film After the Apology follows the stories of four Aboriginal grandmothers and their fight to bring their grandkids home. Shortly we'll be talking to one of them, Hazel Collins, who founded Grandmothers Against Removal, and the film's director, Larissa Berent. But first, here's a short clip from the film. I heard about a meeting happening in Tamworth and I travelled across to that meeting and we sat down and it was in a circle and it went around the room and what I'm hearing is their stories are very similar to mine. There's a lot of commonalities, you know, the false allegations of facts, the lies within affidavits, the lack of anything concrete and the ridiculous reasons that are given for a removal. It's happening everywhere. Things need to change. This is our family. We have nowhere to go. This is why we're here today. We've got nowhere to go. We can't meet nobody. The judge was the one that said, why are you taking this child? You've given me no evidence to prove this child is at risk and they still took my grandson. Why? I'm not allowed to have my grandson because in 1988, I suffered postnatal depression. Yes. Oh, hello. So what are you going to do? And I mean it, you, what are you going to do to so make sure our kids, when they're in care, that they're getting looked after? You say they're in care? I say bloody bullshit to that because they're coming home bruised, bitten, teeth knocked out, bruised and everything, and burnt and everything. These kids are coming back to their families on contact and you are doing nothing. What are you going to do? What are you going to go back and do? Larissa Hazel, nice to have you with us. Thanks, Thank you. Jen. Larissa, we just saw a clip of the film there. What motivated you to want to make it? I'd seen an increase in the number of cases we were getting through our clinic at work where we were seeing really questionable instances of children being removed from their families and even more concerning instances where perhaps the removal needed to take place but not enough care to place mm. children with extended families. So the film was really a way of starting the conversation about why that was happening. And of course, what we were seeing in the clinic with those cases matches the figures that show the increase exponentially can, of, of removals. I, I just want to come to you, Hazel, in just a minute and get your personal story, which is part of this film. But mm. those numbers, if we go back to 2007 and we have the apology and everything that surrounded that, what have we seen since in the increase in the numbers? It's close to something like 100%, isn't it? What we're seeing is that every year since the apology, it has increased about with about 1,000 more children being in out-of-home care. So mm. the figure's now about 18,000 and it's up from around around about nine. Mm. So, so yes, we are seeing a doubling of it. And also, I think importantly, we're seeing a decrease in the number of children placed with their immediate Aboriginal mm. families. So it's a, it's a combination of the two issues. And, and much of the film, of course, draws on personal experience. That's the power of the film. And Hazel, could you tell us about your own personal experience here? Because the issue of removal runs throughout your family. I know yes. go to your mother and, and now to your daughter and, and your fight to get your grandchild returned. Tell us about the impact it's had on your family. It's had a major impact on the family and that impact will never ever go away like for us as adults. And, and for the grandchildren and the rest of the family. I had four grandchildren removed um, from the same daughter. Mm -hmm. And I was present at the last little one, which we sparked grandmothers against removals. And that, that was very traumatising for me. It was hard prior to his removal to try and keep my daughter strong. Um, many times I thought I'd hear a knock on the door. Can, can I just ask why, what the reasons given for the removal? Because four children from the one mother, your daughter, mm. what, why, why were they taken? The first two were removed um, on the basis that they said she was homeless, um, which she wasn't. I requested those two within minutes of them being removed and never got them. Um, 
Then she had her third little fellow removed um, because he was with the other nan and she was letting Helen um, see him, so the department removed mm -hmm. him. And then they m removed her last little fella um, when he was 15 months old because they said they had significant risks. So you've sought to have the children return to you and unsuccessful yes. to, to this point. Why, what are the reasons that they're giving you as to why the children can't be placed with their grandmother? They just said I wasn't suitable. When I asked them what were the grounds, they said they didn't have to tell me that. Um, and then they said I had to have an assessment, which, which I find very demoralising because I, like, I raised my own children, stepchildren, I gathered some along the way, as we as a people do. Um, I had all these grandchildren and yet I had to be assessed to have these little ones. And are you in a position where you feel comfortable and confident that you can provide a home, a secure home for your grandchildren? Yes. Like, I don't drink alcohol, I don't do drugs um, or any of that sort of thing. And, like, I was a nurse for over 30 mm. years. Um, I don't have a criminal record. The things that happened to Hazel happened to other women in the mm. film. And when you think that uh, child protection is a state-based issue, but we're seeing this nationally in the same stories, and particularly this, uh, this phenomena where a grandmother who has raised her own children with no mm. incident is deemed unacceptable as a mm. carer for her children when she doesn't drink, has her mm. own home, has a job. That is one of the trends that's really, really concerning. There are a whole range of other issues that we raise in the film as well that relate to um, assumptions made about Aboriginal families in poverty and what neglect mm. looks like. We raise concerns about the under-resourcing in the departments around the amount of, of, of available attention to early intervention and supporting families so children don't have to be removed and not mm. giving them enough resources to deal with restitution and reunification. But because policy says that children should be placed, Indigenous children, with family members or with other Indigenous people. So where is that breaking down if we are seeing an increase in the number and, 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 and an increase as well, or a decrease rather, in those actually going to Indigenous family members? On that particular phenomenon, every state still has the Aboriginal child placement principle mm. as as a key issue. Mm. And one of the real issues that's, that's concerning is that in the actual application of that principle, judgments are being made that will still privilege non-Indigenous people over Indigenous extended family. And it's one of the things that Hazel, Sue Ellen and Deb in, in the film mm. all started to work together to really address is why aren't these departments abiding by their own mm -hmm. rules? Mm -hmm. There are some hard questions, aren't there, Hazel, when, when you confront this? And that is, you, know, you will often hear in the public uh, a discussion around this that the children must come first and that any risk to the children, they need to be removed from any potential risk. So how do you explain to people watching tonight that these children would be better off uh, with you or with other family members or other Indigenous people? The department is, is flawed in a lot of ways. I'll start off by saying that. Um, where anyone can ring up and make a complaint. When they come to our doors, we often don't get to address those supposed complaints. Mm -hmm. Now, if indeed they're valid, I. I'm very strong on, yes, the, the children need to be protected. And I've never ever said at no time should a child not mm. be taken. But in saying that, we're all not doing this. We're all not putting that child at risk. If indeed they are at risk, then why, why can't we as their family be there to protect them and support them? while whatever the issues are, are being dealt with by mum and dad or wh whoever. That would do away with the trauma of any removal because the little one is just on respite. 
with nan and pop or uncle and aunt or whatever. It's very easy for people to assume that if docs is involved, there's a reason. And I guess one of the things that's shocking to most of us is that actually we see so many cases where actually mistakes are being made. And I think when we're worried about the protection of children, we also have to be mindful of the dangers if we don't remove them when they need to be removed. Yeah. But the dangers to those children, if they're removed and taken away from families who love them when they shouldn't be removed. Hazel, is, is there an issue around the number of, of Indigenous carers? Is there just not enough people saying that they are prepared to take children? Is, is that where one of the, the blockages are in this system? I, I think it is. Um, I myself booked the idea. Um, I, I still don't like that process having to occur. So a lot of Indigenous people don't want to put themselves forward as carers because they don't want to be subject to the process and the vetting. That's right. And, and I, I feel that that's a, a lot of the drawback of Aboriginal people coming forward. Like if I was to walk into a family's home and say, I've got six, seven, eight children, would you take them on and, and that be the process, then I think every Aboriginal person out there would put their hand up. But historically we have this mistrust of the welfare system mm. um, and that's never going to go away. And, and that, that happened in your family as well, where your, your yes. mother was taken. We often hear this phrase that we're facing a second stolen generation. Is that a phrase that you use? Is that what you no. see taking place? I I don't see it as a second stolen generation. To me, it's the same. It's never stopped. The only thing that stopped to me is our people stopped talking. And they this wave of shame wraps around people and there's this stigma that, you know, we can't look after our children. They We deserve to have them taken. So they, mm. our people stopped talking. But now people are starting to talk more and I get phone calls left, right and centre all the time and I know a lot of other ladies do as well from people wanting help. Larissa, what's the importance to children of being uh, placed with other Indigenous people? Because you'll often hear the argument too that children should be placed with those who can care for them. Is there something wrong with placing them with non-Indigenous families? Look, I think the, the concept behind the Aboriginal Child Placement Principle, which really developed from the Bringing Them Home report, recognised how important it was to the well-being of Aboriginal children to have connection to their culture. And that's why the principle says that if the child can't be cared for by their immediate family, they should be with their extended family. If they can't be with their extended family, they should be placed with an Aboriginal family within that broader community. Or, and, and then if that can't happen, then with an Aboriginal family somewhere else. Always keeping in mind the importance of having that cultural connection. And then, it, and the final aspect of the child placement principle is to say if that's not possible, the child should be placed with a non-Indigenous family but with a cultural care plan. And I think there's a lot of concern about what's considered cultural care planning. Just finally, do you think that there was a sense in 2007 <coughs> with the apology that that was job done? and that as a society, maybe we've turned away from this, that we've, we've taken our eye off the problem? I think that many Australians deeply felt um, emotional about the history with child removal, and you can see that with how they responded to the apology. And I think my experience has been that many Australians are shocked to hear that this is an issue that's increasing. They want to know why that is. We made this film for those people who were really interested in hearing the stories of Aboriginal people who've, who've been exposed to this issue in this new way. Um, after the apology is about looking at what needs to, why this is happening and what needs to be done. Um, and, you know, I think Hazel's got a pretty good slogan about the apology. What, what is it? Sorry means you don't do it again. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry means you don't do it again. Yeah. Hazel, and, and just a final thought from you as well. You're concerned now for your own grandchildren. Where are you with that fight to have them return to you? My, my grandchildren are back living with their mum. Um, she has, now has full PR, um, so I'm really happy that they're back with their mum. There are some, a lot, like a lot of issues, they've lost seven years mm. um, and that's something they can never ever get back. 
So there's a lot of rebuilding, um, a lot of issues that we as a family can work through and help each other and our babies. And they're, they're doing okay? They are, they are. And it's, it's absolutely wonderful to see them back with my daughter. And she's doing well? She is. Good on I'm you. I'm really proud of her. Hazel, good to talk to you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And Larissa, good to see you. Thank you. Always. Thanks, Dan.